advantage because uh, it's very easy to hold 25 pounds as against holding 50 pounds while you're uh, aiming. And so this bow is, uh, the compound bow is taking over and about uh, 9 out of 10 of the bows that are sold and used today are made like this. It's interesting to note that the fiberglass technology, the actual ability of preparing the fiberglass yarn uh, to its job that it needs to do in the bow uh, was developed by those of us here at Bear Archery quite a few years ago in the days of the uh, conventional bow. The stresses in the compound bow, the bow with the wheels and the cams, um, are very high. And without this uh, technology, without this already prepared and tested material, we would not have the compound bow. It, it, we would not have any materials to stand up uh, under the stresses that are developed. And we, those of us in Bear Archer are real happy that we've had a, a rather large part in this promotion. In the uh, heavy bows that are used for hunting, which are usually 50 pounds or more, the fact that the weight drops off and to maybe 50 percent or 30 or 40 percent and is easier to hold reminds me of uh, a bow, a U-bow that we made in the very early, early days of our archery business. I had a stave, a beautiful U-stave, full-length six-foot stave that Art Young had given me. And uh, I had a boyer by the name of Nels Grumley and uh, we would occasionally take that stave and look at it and as kind of sort of study it like you might look at a diamond that you're going to cut. Uh, it, the stave was valuable because it was so beautiful and it had extra value because uh, it was given to me by Art Young. So after a couple of years of fooling around and we finally got a bow made and the bow turned out to be 85 pounds. Well, 85 pounds is, is a lot of bull. And uh, you, when a U wood is finished, U wood bow is finished, and, and you put a string on it and weigh it, whatever that weight is, if the bow is properly tilted and nicely made, that's the weight it, sh it should stay at. But 85 pounds was entirely too heavy. And I first gave it to a friend of mine who lived up in West Branch. He was a real husky uh, woodsman, outdoorsman. And uh, he shot it for a while, and then it wound up in the hands of a fellow over on the east side of Michigan. I've forgotten his name. And uh, he went hunting with it, went deer hunting with it one day. And uh, he saw a beautiful buck coming at an angle. Uh, I'm going to pass him real close, and he was going to get a good shot. So he waited till the deer's head <laughs> was behind a big tree, and then he pulled his bow back. Well, the deer stopped, <laughs> and he said, I didn't know. He said it was so heavy, I couldn't hold it, but he said, I knew if I let it down, I couldn't get it back again. <laughs> so I never did get the, the rest of the story, but uh, he didn't get the deer, and, and uh, that was one of the problems that we had with heavy bows that is eliminated by the use of the compound bow. You're, you're holding a much lighter weight, and if the deer... <laughs> Stop his head behind the tree, you can always wait. Again, referring to our early days in Detroit where our business began in 1933, uh, the uh, Belgians, quite a number of people from Belgium in Detroit that time, there still are, yes, they, uh, in, their old, in, their old, in the old country, uh, used to have pop and jay shoots with a big pole went way up in the air and had arms on it and the uh, arms had little pointed spikes on it and they'd make a little bird out of a wooden clothespin they'd drill a hole through it and put it on there and they had a we'd put a little some bird feathers on it look, make it look like a bird and you stood under the pole and shot straight up with an arrow that had a, a head on it about an inch in diameter the head was made out of uh, uh, Asiatic buffalo horn and uh, that really was uh, not so much an archery shooting match, more of a drinking match because you got one shot. You, you, 
you drew a number when you went when you registered. You drew a number, and there might be 50 shooters. Maybe there's 100 shooters. A big tournament. And when your number came up, you got out there and you shot an arrow. And then uh, you didn't get turned again until everybody else had shot an arrow. In the meantime, there was usually a keg there, and, uh, <laughs> and it was quite an affair. Well, in Detroit, we couldn't, the, it, they had horizontal uh, archery ranges. Pop and Jay is what was the name of it. That's what they call the birds, a pop and Jay. It was a Jay bird. And uh, they shot horizontally in Detroit indoors. And uh, there, was, there was a range there. I, I think the name of it was a Green Tavern. And they had this range downstairs. And the upstairs was, was a bar. And we also threw darts up there. And it was quite a deal. Well, their bows, made in Belgium, were laminated bows made of three different kind of woods. And uh, they were very long, six and some of them seven feet. And because they were so long and so hard to get around with in a car or a street car, they, they had them take apart. It was a feral type thing, like uh, take a fish rod apart. Well, now on a trip I made to Alaska, uh, with the conventional longbow that I had to check as baggage along with my other gear. Uh, I took a flight nonstop from Chicago to Anchorage and uh, I got off the plane but my archery equipment didn't and <laughs> the stop in Anchorage was for fuel and uh, my hunt was a fly-in hunt and uh, I'm being left-handed. There were no other left-handers in the party and I found those moose pretty hard to kill with rocks, so I determined that I would make a, a bow that could be taken apart and put in a small enough case to go under my seat in the airplane. The first attempt was this one here. Um, <laughs> this is even before the fiberglass thing because that has a piece of vulcanized fiber on for the backing. And this is a laminated bow like the uh, Belgians use also with hickory. The light wood is, is hickory in this bow, and this face wood is Osage orange, which is stronger than you and a harder wood. It also has the solid, non-working recurve. Well, the bow I made, this first design, comes apart like that. It's an iron hook that hooks into a piece of steel that's screwed and glued to the bow. And that was uh, all right, that worked good, except the only advantage was it was a take apart. And if half the bow broke, well, what do you do? You uh, have to make the whole thing over again and, and match it up with the other half. And that didn't work out so good. So I finally decided that the handle of the bow, the middle section of the bow, being the major part of the bow and where most of the work was that if I made a handle and limbs that would slide into it and be fastened into it, it'd be a pretty good deal and it would be uh, in a real small container no problem getting it under the seat and real handy and then you could also change limbs you could have limbs for practice or limbs for your wife or son or whatnot, and uh, limbs of different length you, you take them right out and put them in. And this was the first model of that bow. Uh, these, these limbs came out, were held in with this little thing like a shotgun, just like taking a double barrel shotgun apart. You push a lever and two pieces come apart in your hand. No screws, bolts, nothing. And I took this bow to Africa in 1964, and uh, I shot a Asiatic buffalo with it. But this system, this socket system, was not right. It was too expensive to make. That was the main thing that was wrong with it. So we came went back to the workbench, and a couple of years later, we came up with the final design, where the you pull this little clip back, and the limb comes right out. The limb itself straddles a tongue or uh, a groove in the handle there and it always goes back straight very easy to put together and no big problem and you can break it down into a case that's less than two feet long um, this is the bow that is the ultimate 
There are lots of limbs that you bolt in, like on the compound bow, and there's all kinds of takedown, but this is the, the takedown that everybody likes best, and we still produce it. This is my personal hunting bow. I've been hunting with this bow since uh, 1965, when we changed from this kind of a experimental socket to this kind, which is uh, what we uh, still have today. Uh, I still shoot this bow, this conventional bow. A lot of people wonder why I don't shoot the compound bow. Well, I taught myself to shoot. And uh, when you t teach yourself sports, sometimes without any instructions how, exactly how to do it, you sometimes develop bad faults. And uh, I had a lot of them. And I, I finally turned out to be a snap shooter. And uh, there are two kinds of snap shooters. I want to warn you about this. W w one of them is, is when you're afflicted with a, a problem, a metal problem uh, called freezing. And it, it seems silly to, to say that there, you have trouble. When you suffer from this uh, problem, it, it seems silly to say that you cannot pull the bow all the way back and hold it while you're aiming. And uh, you develop into being a snap shooter. But most snap shooters never get the bow back to the full draw. Most snap shooters who are suffering from this uh, a little thing I'm talking about, and it's called freezing. Um, never get the bow back far enough. So for that reason, uh, their aiming is haphazard, and uh, it doesn't impart all the velocity to the arrow that the bow would if it were to pull back all the way. I went through that. There was a couple of years when uh, uh, I went hunting, and I wished I wouldn't see a deer to shoot at, because I, I knew that I wouldn't shoot well. Matter of fact, I made a film, our first deer hunting film, uh, under that condition, and <laughs> I made a, I lost a, a, a couple of good chances at some deer. But I was hoping I wouldn't see a deer. Terrible, isn't it? Well, uh, I simp I, I, because of this, I found that if I could concentrate uh, right from the top of my head to the end of my toes on the very, very center of the target, not the bullseye, but the center of the bullseye, and if I talked to myself at each shot and pulled the bow all the way back until I came to full draw, that, uh, that I, I had the thing pretty well licked. And I used a heavy bow because a heavy bow helped me. This, this bow I've been shooting is 65 pounds. I've shot that all the time. Um, I, I found that if the bow is heavier, you get a better loose and everything works out better. So I'm, I'm a snap shooter. And, uh, I'm aiming when I'm drawing. It's like, you, you ask a pitcher, how does he throw the ball right across the outside corner of the plate? He doesn't have any mechanical way to do it. The, the, the body, the human body is a great piece of equipment and you can by practice and training teach it to do almost anything. And when you have practice shooting instinctively, and I mean instinctively, I don't mean uh, with uh, String walking or or uh, a gap system. I mean just by concentrating uh, from the end of your toes to the top of your head on the very tiny spot that you want to hit. It's amazing what the body can do, and that's the way the pitcher does. He does it by practice. How does he? The outfielder heave the ball in and hits the ground and into the catcher's mitt. And the first hop when the fellow's stealing home, how does, you, how does the carpenter hit the nail on the head? It's all in, in, the, in the human body to be able to do that from practice. So my style of shooting has always been, since uh, in the last 40 years, instinctive shooting and uh, by the snap shooting method. And it's worked out for me. I don't recommend it to anybody because it takes a lot of practice and a lot of concentration. And you have to have, I think, a certain knack, a certain feel to be good at it. The same as there are good pitchers and there are bad pitchers. And there's fellows that can throw the ball to the home plate on the first bounce and the fellows that can't. 
So, uh, uh, as I say, I